today I'm going to be sharing some tips on how to paint wet fur. For anyone who has been following along with all of the work I've been doing in my yard, at the end of today's video, I'm going to be sharing some new growth updates that I'm pretty excited about and some flowers that I planted. For those of you who are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got over three and a half hours of this lesson available for you now. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon, for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. I have over 200 available for you to watch as soon as you sign up and a new one every single week in multiple mediums. If you're not sure if Patreon is going to be a fit for you, you can head over to my Patreon video library, see what's available, and I have one sample lesson for you there in colored pencil. So for this one, I started by painting just a teal basic, whatever color you really want for your background, and I used tracing and transfer paper to transfer my image onto the canvas. This way I don't have a lot of eraser marks. You can, even if you want to freehand, you don't have to trace it, but you can freehand that onto another piece of paper, trace it, and then use that transfer paper to get a clean transfer of that image onto the canvas. No eraser marks at all. It's wonderful. Next, I'm using my airbrush to get this really soft, out of focus look for the background water. You can see I can go right over the, the otter here. I'm still going to be able to see the base layer of the otter, but it lets me have a pretty good idea of where I want those lines to be. If I hadn't painted in the block shape of where the otter is going to be, it would have been harder for me to judge where I wanted the water to curve around. So this just simplifies things for me a bit. You can do this without the airbrush. You're just not going to get quite as soft of a transition there. Using some greens now in between these colors. And the airbrush setup that I'm using is the Grex airbrush. This one, you can change the size of the needle. It's wonderful. I have videos specifically on that airbrush and some airbrush tips. I'll put a link in the video description to the setup that I use along with a pop-up here of that demonstration. So I've used my tracing and transfer paper method again to get all of the basic lines of my sea otter onto that brown background. I'm starting with the nose, blocking things in. Now I don't need anything in here to be exact as far as the texture on the nose or the fur, but I do want it to be close. The only thing I want pretty exact is my general outline of the otter, his eye, the shape of his nose, the shape of his mouth. Those need to be pretty, pretty close to exact. But as far as the fur goes, close is good enough. But you do want to pay close attention to your reference photo to watch which direction the fur is moving in. Most of the brushes that I'm using are Taclon bristled either filberts or rounds, and then the liner brush that I'm using is a synthetic hog-haired liner brush. So blocking in the shape of the eye, I want to get that glassy rounded look. So I've got that highlight. Notice that my highlight rounds. It's not just a little dot. His teeth are gonna look really weird until I get the whiskers blocked in, but I just need them, the general idea of where those are going to go. Now, remember when you paint teeth, you're almost never going to use, paint them white. That will look really weird. Teeth, generally, even if you're doing a portrait of a person, they are going to fall within shadow. So most of the colors that you use when painting teeth are darker cream or brown tones. So now I'm starting to block in the darker shadows here. Again, paying attention to which direction that fur moves in. Now in painting fur, the way that we get it to look wet is to create really defined clumps and clusters and to make sure that we've got high contrast between our lights and our darks. That's one of the ways we're gonna make it look wet. So not just the clumps and clusters, which is something that we do a lot anyway when painting fur, but we, we define those clumps and clusters more. And then that really high contrast with the lights and darks. Those are the two things you really wanna watch when painting wet fur. And you want to watch too, here as he, we move through this, parts of his fur are going to be a little bit more dry, so they're not going to be painted quite the same way. The areas that are clumped together more, that is the fur that is going to be wet. Then you'll have the fur that is soaking, soaking wet, and it's just this glassy look where you're not really defining individual hairs. So pay attention to your reference photo. Now this reference photo came from wildlifereferencephotos.com. You can purchase that photo if you wanted to paint this exact same one. I'll put a link to their website in the video description. I'm not affiliated with them at all. I just use their website a lot. Really good photos. 
I'm blocking in the fur. Now, as I do the fur, I had done the black first. Now I'm just using unbleached titanium white. I'm not worrying about the color at all. I'm building up my general lights and darks and the shapes. The shapes and the fur texture are all I really care about. I'm gonna come back through after the underpainting is in there and define my colors better. I'll just glaze over to get the color that I want and then go back and define the fur, different individual strands of fur even better. But I find it to be easier to tackle if I'm not having to worry about trying to mix the perfect color on top of trying to map out which direction the fur goes. I can build these up in two separate ways and it's very similar to how I do people portraits where I will do the underpainting in sepia tones in just with raw umber and white or black and white and then go back over it glazing the color. It, it separates two elements of the painting that are a bit challenging, mixing the color you want and getting the detail. Here, because I'm doing those two areas more separately, it makes it much, much easier to tackle. So you can see he looks fairly flat. I'm only using black here for the darks and then the unbleached titanium white, but it simplifies everything so much. So this is the area where the fur is really, really wet. So we're not going to take a bunch of time trying to put in individual strands of fur. The fur's just all glossed together here. So that's one of the three types of like how wet the fur is. And then we're going to do these, these water ripples. Some of them I'm blending out where I get towards the edge of the canvas. That is where I want it to just fade, kind of be out of focus. And then I'm, I'm making the lines much more crisp as I'm closer to the otter where we're closer, we're more in canvas or in, in, in canvas, in focus. Speaking of canvases, because I can't use proper words, this is a Frederick's canvas. This one is their, it, the equivalent would be a, a, a convexo canvas. These were their float canvases. They don't make these anymore, but the convexo canvases would probably be the closest. Now with these canvases, they have a bit more tooth, just like the convexo canvas. I love the, the shape of the canvases, but the, they're, they're a bit too rough for my taste. So what I do is put a couple of coats of gesso on it, let it dry completely, and then use a anywhere between a 220 to a 320, 330, something like that, somewhere around those. I don't remember the numbers, but I'll use that to sand it to a fine, fine surface, that really smooth surface, which makes all of this little detail that I'm doing much, much easier. And just for transparency, I am sponsored by Fredericks. They did provide me with the canvas that I am painting here, but they were already all I used. So no real difference as far as what I would personally recommend. I had some bad experiences with canvas and I am not willing to risk my work with those again. So I had sworn off everything but Fredericks years ago. And then later on, I ended up working with Fredericks for some promotional stuff. But yeah, they were already my favorite canvas. But in a case like this, where I really like the shape of the canvas, but it has a bit much, too much tooth, I just use some Liquitex gesso and then sand it. So here we're starting to add some of the color in there. We've got some grays and some blues, but again, notice that the I'm not focusing on individual strands of fur. The fur is just soaking, soaking wet there. So it's basically plastered around his little paws. Now for acrylics, most of the brushes I'm using are Taclon bristled. You really can't go wrong with those. And I've used many, many different brands. Simply Simmons I really like. I like the generic of Hobby Lobby. It's one of the only generic type art materials that I like are paint brushes. I may change my mind someday and decide I like more expensive brushes better. But as of right now, these just have always worked really well for me. But Taclon bristled brushes are my general go-to when it comes for acrylic painting. Other than my liner brush, which I then switch over to my synthetic hog hair. I do use some mop brushes, which I did not use in this painting. But with the mop brushes, I usually use makeup brushes. Blush brushes work really well. They don't shed as much as art brushes for mop brushes. So now I'm starting to glaze my color. Now for glazing, all I'm doing is thinning my paint down with water. So I make that paint very translucent and I just brush over the area that I want to tint the color of. You're still seeing what's underneath it. You're seeing all of that detail, but I've tinted the color. Now this is one of the reasons that I like Liquitex Basics so much. This paint tends to be more translucent. Not a huge fan of the Liquitex Heavy Body or the Soft Body. They, they're useful for certain techniques 
the technique that I'm using here, Liquitex Basics works the best. And so people will, will occasionally ask me why I'm using student grade paint. I'm not using it because it's cheaper. I mean, it is cheaper, but I'm using it because it just is very, very suitable to my painting style where I'm doing a lot of these glazing, the glazing. The other thing that's really nice, the Liquitex Basics, they don't dry quite as fast as Liquitex heavy body or soft body. Those paints dry really fast in comparison. And that's not to say one is better than the other, it's just a difference in technique. For my technique, Liquitex Basics, hands down. So as I've gone through here, you can see where I'm starting to add a lot more of those highlights over those clumps of fur where I've tinted the color previously. A huge tip I have for you, no matter what you're painting, you are going to have layers where you're thinking, oh, this looks terrible, I don't know if I'm gonna pull this one off, maybe I should just start over. Don't, paint and layer until it looks good. Just keep painting, keep going. Don't keep starting over every time you hit an ugly stage, you're never going to progress. You're gonna learn more from figuring out how to fix something that you don't like the look of than giving up. Plus look here, we've got a, a not a good, this isn't the cutest stage. That is definitely getting into those ugly stage areas. But watch how we just keep layering until it does look good. Having that feeling of, oh my gosh, I've ruined it. It looks terrible. That happens to me on every single painting. It has happened my entire life. It is a completely normal feel. You just want, or feeling, you just want to keep layering until it looks good. Remember a bad layer doesn't mean you've ruined anything. It just means you're not finished yet. Keep layering until you like how it looks adding those whiskers. Now look how the teeth, it doesn't matter that they looked terrible. I didn't need to define the teeth well. I needed a hint of teeth behind the whiskers. Now that the whiskers are in there, it makes a lot more sense. Lo notice those little dots that I'm adding all over. It gives that little bit of a sparkle. It looks like the water is shimmering and even on the whiskers, it makes the whiskers look a little bit more wet by having a couple of dots or a few dots of just white there. I've done that along the edge where the water line meets the fur as well and a little bit just in the water moving out. The other thing with the dots, they're not just random polka dots everywhere. Look how I've grouped them in twos, threes, fours. They're grouped together. And back to just layer and tell you like how it looks. Really pay attention to general shapes in your work too. Look at everything as an abstract shape. If you look at this as I'm painting fur, your brain is gonna go, oh, fur, I've got this. I know what this looks like. We don't even need to look at that reference photo. And your end result is not going to be as realistic as you may have hoped it to be. So instead, break things down into little sections, maybe one square inch, two square inches, only focus on that. Turn your work and your reference photo upside down if you need to and really pay attention to the shapes. Where are the lights? Where are the darks? Also, don't put too much attention or, or, or worry too much about the color you choose. It's not that big of a deal. If you look at your, your reference photo and it's brown, paint it brown. Doesn't matter which brown, not that much. What matters are your values. Are your darks dark enough and your lights light enough? That is going to make a far, far bigger difference than picking the perfect shade of brown. The perfect shade of brown doesn't matter if your values are correct, if your darks are dark enough, your lights are light enough, that's what's going to make your work look realistic. Everyone gets hung up on thinking, if I only knew what color to use, my work would look realistic too. No, that really doesn't have very much to do with it. it it's your values. Look at where the darks and lights go. That's what's going to give it form and depth. See how I just keep layering and going back over different areas. I'll take a step away from the canvas and look at it and decide, okay, what needs to adjust? What looks off? What, what do I think I could adjust on the reference photo too? Don't feel like everything on the reference photo needs to be exact. That's just your general guideline. You're using that to have, well, a general idea of where things go. But you're going to get to a point, especially towards the end of the painting, where you want to start taking a step back, not looking so much at the, the reference photo and looking at your artwork. What would make yours look better. This is where your you being an artist comes in and you decide maybe I want like little sparkles on the whisker that aren't on the reference photo. Maybe I need this dark area to be a bit darker. This area, need, it, it looks a little too light. Let's tone that down. These are things that you need to decide as an artist at the end of your painting. What could you make yours look even better than the reference photo by like what little things could you change to make that happen?
And there is my finished painting. Notice in the water ripples too, how high that contrast is between the lights and the dark. That's one of the things that is going to help you to create more shimmery looking water. Don't be afraid of hyping up your contrast between those lights and the darks in your painting. So if your reference photo is a bit more muted, it will almost always look better if you make your darks a little bit darker and your lights a little bit lighter. Here is a little bit of a spring update on my yard. We've got the sweet potatoes potted and they are starting to grow. We're starting to see a little bit new growth there. The petunias that I potted, they look like they're starting to fill out, out a little bit. I've got a topiary that needs a little bit of a trim, letting him fill out a bit more. Coming back here, these abelias, my neighbor's gardenias died off during the freeze. So he's going to take these for his front flower bed, they're going to fill out. I had just trimmed them back. So they look a little bit frumpy right now. I bought these thinking I was going to plant them where I planted all of the ornamental grasses. I bought it last year. They were just going to live in the pot for a year. The abelias, they are not really meant for pots, but I changed my mind and went with ornamental grasses instead. So we're going to give these to my neighbor who could use them now that his stuff had not done so well. I'm going to replace those with some bougainvilleas in that pot. I planted these dianthus and uh, just on the side here of these pots, I may put some more. That dead stuff that you see in there, that was Mexican heather. It looks like it might come back. The roots are in there really strong. It looks like there is a little bit of life in the stems there. So I'm gonna give that a bit of a chance to come back before I pull that out. But these dianthus flowers, I am in love with the stuff that I planted last year. They're still going strong. So I decided to plant them all over my yard this year. Here is one of my my crepe myrtles, look at the little buds. They're starting to grow. So I'm really excited to see some life there. Crepe myrtles tend to be one of the last shrubs to fill out in the year. So I'm really excited to, to already be seeing a little bit of growth or life there. These guys, the flowers are taking off. They're normally completely covered in bees. They, the bees really, really like these shrubs and the shrubs seem to be pretty happy since I took them. I bought them at the same time I did the abelias last year and I thought I was going to put those same place where I ended up doing the ornamental grasses, but I stuck those in there um, or, or under the crepe myrtles and they're doing good so far. And then here are my variegated lily turfs. We can see some new growth coming in here. I'm really happy about that. I trimmed the, all the dead stuff off earlier so I'm happy to see they're starting to grow. These petunias, I was going to put dianthus in all of these these pots here but when I saw these petunias there was no way I couldn't buy them. So they'll only really look good until late July by August they're going to need to be replaced with something else. They don't do super well in the heat so depending on how heat June July is it will depend on how well these do. But last year when I had planted them, they got huge overgrowing the pots they were in. So they looked great until the heat hit. So they're, they're a temporary type flower. Look at how much, how many blooms are on these this year. I'm so happy. Got more of this type of the petunia. I'm so excited too to start seeing butterflies and bees in the yard. You can see that guy there. Come back, there he goes, so cute. The birds are starting to use the bird baths. Uh, you'll have to excuse, occasionally you'll see a piece of trash on the floor because trash it's been windy and trash from the builders blows and I'm constantly picking up trash. So there are my bird feeders. Let's go over here around the tree. Some more, these are the dianthus I was talking about. These guys do so well in the heat. They lived all winter too, which really surprised me. I did bring the pots, these are new ones, but the ones that I had in my front yard, I brought them into the garage when we had that really deep, like bad freeze here in Texas and they made it, they lived, they're all do, they're doing better than most of my other stuff, which is odd. Those ones were supposed to be annuals, I believed, I believe, but it looks like they just stayed great all year. And then this tree, this is a cedar elm. Look, we've got buds starting on him too. He's a little late this year. The freeze slowed everybody down. But I'm really, really excited to see all of this new growth. Makes me so happy. And then I had to repot all of this Mexican feather grass. This, all of the previous year's grasses, those did die off during the, the freeze. I don't know why I didn't bring those into the garage. I should have. Those pots would have been easy, but not the big one. But the smaller ones, I could have easily brought those in and saved them. And I, I just didn't think about it. Oh, Gibson working hard again, I see. His favorite spot is laying out in the sun. Yeah, he, he's working hard. 
So these are my other abelias. I did plant those in the ground last year and they, they didn't, they, part, there was some freeze damage, but I trimmed that off. That's why they're all flat right now. And we've got a lot of new gro growth coming in. So those guys are doing fine. And the grass is starting to turn green. Every day it's more and more green. So I'm really excited about the yard. That's, that's about it for updates. I'm sure I will, I will share more as everything gets even more green. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. Don't forget to click on the bell notification icon because YouTube's been horrible about notifying people when a video goes live lately.